Florida, uh, welcome. And I hope we can do some conservation this morning. Um, we have an agenda. You all should be, have been given the agenda. Um, I would like to make an addition to the, agenda, to the agenda. When we're discussing cobia management, we would also like to discuss any recommendations that we might have to the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council on Framework 4. Um, we'll do that during the discussion of, of cobia. Are there any other suggestions about changes to the agenda? Is there any objection to accepting the agenda as amended? Seeing none, the agenda is set. Um, we also have the proceedings from our May meeting, and I'm sure that most of you can remember how much fun that was. Um, are there any suggestions to uh, edit or change the proceedings to the proceedings of the May meeting? Seeing none, is there any, object any objections to accepting those proceedings? Seeing none, the proceedings are accepted. Um, public comment, do we have any members from the public that wish to speak on items that are not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll go forward. Um, at, our la at our May meeting, the um, policy board passed the staff to create a white paper about cobia management, and I think that we'll have an explanation about that in a few minutes, and we have uh, an honorary member who agreed to help work on this issue. Uh, Dr. Lewis Bluegill Daniel is here with us to make a presentation about possible uh, cobia management actions that we might take. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it is a delight to be back in, in Alexandria and be with you again. Um, I am um, working for the commission on a limited basis, um, putting together the COBIA information for you. Um, and so I'll go through a, I tried to keep it short and sweet for you, um, to go through the issues as they pertain to COBIA management. Um, and essentially these fish range from Nova Scotia to Argentina. Uh, I think the Scotian fish were lost, but um, they're uncommon north of Maryland. We'll talk more about that here shortly. Um, they're an extremely valuable fishery to the for hire and recreational sector, and they serve primarily uh, as a bycatch um, in the commercial fishery. Briefly, the management history, um, cobia have been managed by the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council through the Coastal Migratory Pelagics FMP since 1982 um, as a unit stock from the east coast of Florida to New York. Um, management has been precautionary throughout the time series um, with a two fish limit for commercial and recreational fishermen and a size limit of 33 inches fork length. So the thought was there to be, I think, at the time, to be extremely precautionary on cobia. Um, the primary fishery occurs when they're spawning. So let's be, let's be precautionary and preemptive on any potential problems and maintain this fishery as a, as a small fishery. Um, Amendment 18 um, did establish allowable catch limits um, in 2012. And some recent genetics studies indicate two separate populations of cobia. The Gulf Group, which is the east coast of Florida and around the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic Migratory Group, which you'll see me denote here from here on as AMG cobia, um, which occur from the Georgia-Florida line north to New York and may occur north of there. And we do have some landings records from north of New York. Further with the management history, um, Amendment 20B revised catch limits based on the stock assessment. That stock assessment was the CDAR, Southeast Data Assessment and Review um, 28, and modified the boundary between the Atlantic and Gulf based on the recent genetic studies. Um, the current management strategy, which you'll go over, I think, after my presentation, um, coming out of the South Atlantic is Framework Action Amendment 4. Um, that's currently being developed to address overages of the allowable catch limits by the recreational fisheries of the Atlantic Migratory Group. To briefly summarize current issues and probably the primary reason we're here um, at this particular point, the National Marine Fisheries Service announced a closure to the AMG COBIA effective June 20th of 2016 for exceeding the allowable catch limit in 2015. The allowable catch limit for 
for our cobia in 2015 was 630,000 pounds. That's based on the stock assessment. While landings were 1.5 million pounds. So an extraordinary overage of the, of the recreational ACL for 2015. The closure that was scheduled for June the 20th impacted the fishery throughout the range of the, cobia, of the AMG cobia, but impacts were greatest for the Outer Banks of North Carolina and all the states from Virginia to the northern extent of the range. Virginia and North Carolina reacted to the closures recently by implementing state-specific regulations to try and lessen the impact of the closures on their specific states. So to kind of give you a sense of why this is so important, the recreational fishery occurs primarily from April to October in nearshore and offshore waters. And based on the MRIP information, about 82% of the cobia harvest is reported from in-state waters. But you can see from this graphic that the dominant landings occur during that May-June wave three. But there's substantial landings during the July-August wave. And so the June 20 closure had a significant impact on the later fisheries that occur along the, along the east coast of, 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 our, of our jurisdiction. Where the fish go from October to April is a is a good question um, and one that I hope we will be able to delve into if we, if we move forward and develop um, something further on this fishery. So the fishery generally begins as fish move near shore off of Georgia in early spring and proceeds northward. Just to give you a, an idea of where the landings come from, uh, the majority of the recreational landings occur in North Carolina and Virginia from May through July during most years. But you'll notice here that during, while, while North Carolina and Virginia many years account for 80 to 90 percent of the total landings, there is variability in those trends on an annual basis. And I think particularly to note is the, is the, is the landings from South Carolina, for example, in 2007, the landings from Georgia, particularly in 2008, and again from South Carolina in 2012. So it is variable as the fishery moves south to north. But generally, North Carolina and Virginia can't take the lion's share of the cobia landings recreationally. At least they have since from 2005 to 2015. Important to note here that there are no MRIP landings reported north of Virginia. So just to look at the Jover general trend, recreational landings from 2005 to 2015, it's a pretty variable trend over the time series until this past year when the recreational ACL was exceeded. Um, you can note, you'll note here that with a, with a, with a recreational ACL of 630,000 pounds, it, it would have been exceeded in seven of the last 11 years. To look at the landings a little more completely and not to forget our friends in Florida, um, this is all in your, in your white paper that was distributed in your supplemental material. Um, from 2005 to 2015, these are the landings from Virginia. And I include the east coast of Florida to give you an idea of the magnitude of the landings in that recreational fishery. And, and, and the next iteration of this presentation, I'll have the, a comparison of the total landings from the, uh, from the AMG Cobia and the east coast of Florida because in putting this together, I noticed they're fairly diphasic in terms of they don't track one another. Some years, the, the, east, the, the AMG Cobia will have very high landings and the Florida landings down and vice versa. So there is some, they don't track one another very well. But you can see here from the east coast of Florida landings that they do have a significant landing of, 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 of cobia in the, yeah, off the east coast of Florida. Looking at the commercial fishery, again, those trends have shown an increase since 2011. Um, the, the areas here are the Georgia, down below Georgia, South Carolina, very, very minor landings. Um, the mid-Atlantic states, which is essentially Virginia, and then reported landings from the states of Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island. 
um, also have reported landings during the time series. Not every year north of Virginia do those states have landings, but episodically through that time series they have reported landings, mostly in the three to 400 pound range. And then for North Carolina, you can see the general trend tracks the Mid-Atlantic since 2011 with, with pretty steadily increasing landings. Um, you know, there was a late season closure in 2014 as the result of going over the ACL for the commercial fishery. Um, and an overage, a pretty significant overage occurred um, in 2015, but that information came in so late that, the, that we weren't able to react um, to a closure um, in 2015. But just a reminder that these closures um, in the commercial fishery do raise some concerns for discards um, in a bycatch fishery. And, and just briefly, and this is in the white paper, the fishery is primarily a bycatch in the troll fisheries for king mackerel and other species, as well as a pretty substantive bycatch um, in the South Atlantic snapper grouper complex fishery where they tend to, when they move offshore, after the spawning season, they tend to, to tend to aggregate around wrecks and reefs and live bottom areas, where they are sub, where they are um, subject to um, bottom fish fishermen, snapper grouper fishermen. General same general trend in Florida East Coast commercial landings. Um, they're not included in the AMG Cobia quotas and are managed through the Gulf Council portion of the plan. But you can see their general trend in their landings is likewise up over the last five years. Well, not the last five years. These are the latest, most recent data we had for the, for the Florida landings. But they are seeing an increase in those landings as well. And so further examination into why those landings are increasing the way they are um, is something that we'd like to look at in the future. Just a basic uh, summary of the stock status. Um, and, and John Carmichael's here w to my left um, with the South Atlantic. Um, and, and between the two of us, I think we can answer any of your questions on the stock status. The most recent assessment was the 2013 Cobia Benchmark Assessment with data through 2011. Um, while the assessment indicates that the stock is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring, the assessment does indicate an overall decline in stock biomass. And I pulled out this one figure that I think is pretty pertinent to this discussion um, with the SSB over SSB MSY uh, ratio and you can see that from about 1995 to present there's been a fairly steady decline to where we are approaching the one to one ratio of SSB over SSB MSY and if we fall below that one then we would be considered overfished. So we're getting close on that in that particular graphic. Um, the, the, so the assessment does indicate an overall decline in stock biomass. The 2015 recreational landings exceeded the overfishing limit as well as the ACL. The overfishing limit is set at 699,200 pounds. And so with the landings at about 1.5 million, we basically doubled the overfishing limit in 2015, resulting in at least the council's determination overfishing for 2015 in the recreational fishery. There is a new benchmark stock assessment scheduled for 2018 to further look at the trends and particularly in this SSB graphic. Just a little more detail on the stock boundaries. The new Cobia stock boundaries were established through South Atlantic Council Amendment 20B in 2014. And beginning March the 1st of 2015, the Atlantic Migratory Group Cobia annual catch limits apply from Georgia through New York. So Cobia caught off the east coast of Florida are now counted against the Florida east coast allocation of the Gulf of Mexico Cobia annual catch limit. And as was discussed, to continue to look at this stock ID question and is that the, the, the commission was able to get the, a Cobia stock ID workshop, um, uh, Cobia included, in the stock ID workshop in 2017. So hopefully by the 2018 stock assessment we'll have a good handle on the, the the boundaries and the, the, stocks, the, the, the stock boundaries for the stock assessment. There is some chance, based on some of the discussions with the analysts, that there could be some drop down into the state of Florida. But right now the data being used for this is, a, I think, a study out of South Carolina where they had, did have a lot of samples from what is considered the mixing zone, which is right around the Florida-Georgia border. 
So based on these issues, concerns, problems, um, the commission uh, received a letter from the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council requesting that the commission consider cobia management at some level. The ISFMP board um, at your May meeting directed staff to develop a white paper to consider options for moving forward. And so based on the discuss those discussions and based on a review of the minutes of your board meeting, we put together two potential options for your consideration here today. And I'll go through these and then we can start back, Mr. Chairman, if that satisfies your plan. Um, the first issue is the, the COBIA management plan options um, to A, develop a management, a, a management plan structure should the plan be a complementary plan between the Atlantic States and the South Atlantic, option one. Option two is a joint fishery management plan between the Commission and the, and the South Atlantic. Option three is an ASMFC exclusive management plan which would not include the, the council. Option four is status quo, which means we would continue to just have the South Atlantic Council operate the way they have and, and simply abide by the closures or come up with some ind independent state options to monitor those quotas. And if there are any other options that the board may have in mind that they could bring up during this discussion. And then the second issue that we felt we needed clarification on and direction is the board structure. Um, there are basically, we basically have three options. There could be others. Um, option one would be to have this board, the South Atlantic State Federal Fishery Management Board, handle the issues related to um, uh, COBIA, um, reaching out to states that have an interest in sitting at this board to discuss these issues if so desired. Um, option two would be a standalone Atlantic Migratory Group COBIA board. And option three is an option that where we could possibly split out species that are currently within the South Atlantic board and try to coordinate species that are more alike. So one option would be to perhaps include the, the red drum, black drum, and cobia as a single unit in the South Atlantic board and maybe have the smaller um, cobia, I mean, uh, croaker spot we, uh, speckled trout, Spanish mackerel in a separate group, but that's for the board to discuss. The short-term timeline, you have a long-term, very, very detailed timeline in the white paper that's in your supplemental materials, but for, for just for the next meeting or two, um, if the board moves in direction or recommend, recommends to the ISFFP policy board to move forward with the COVID plan, we would begin developing the PID for your review and approval, hopefully, in November of 2016. During the period between the annual meeting and the end of January, staff would conduct public meetings and accept public comment. And then at 2017 board meeting, you would review public comments and direct FMP development. So with that, a couple of nice cobias off of Wrightsville Beach, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. Do we have questions? Uh, Malcolm. <clears throat> Just one question. Um, since we've talked about or have been brought up with the east coast of Florida and the Gulf, how does, is the Gulf stock handled? Is it solely council? Is it commission? Do they have some complementary plan going? Um, just to see how it's handled in our neighboring jurisdiction. Well, and I've got Roy, we've got Roy, Dr. Roy Crabtree and John Carmichael here, but, but there is a joint coastal migratory pelagics plan between the South Atlantic and the Gulf. And so in, it, this is so, consistent with the way that, say, King Mackerel are handled, where the King Mackerel Gulf are handled in a separate but equal situation as the um, Atlantic King Mackerel. So in the Gulf for, for Gulf Cobia, they have their own special stock assessment, and they have specific ACLs and overfishing limits in the same, and, and they're handled as two separate stocks, two separate species. So they're, they're managed the same way as the as the council manages the Atlantic Group Cobia. In their council, in the Gulf, it's council. The states aren't involved at this time, so there. I don't. I'm not aware that they've talked to the Gulf States Commission about getting involved. So it's strictly council management. Thank you, John. Robert. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not uh, and Dr. Daniel, thank you for an excellent presentation and excellent work. Um, I, no surprise, I think that we have, um, from our perspective in South Carolina, a lot to gain from um, coordinated management, whatever that coordinated management looks like. Um, I've sat here before at this table and uh, pled my case for um, um, the Ben Franklin approach to fisheries management. We shall all hang, if we don't all hang together, we will all certainly hang separately. So with 82% of the catch occurring in state waters, I think this is a species that uh, um, certainly lends itself to um, interjurisdictional fisheries. And Dr. Daniel, thank you for your um, excellent presentation. Um, a question perhaps for Roy, and this might be a nuanced question that maybe I should handle um, um, separately and, and offline, but um, in South Carolina, we manage COBE again because it's a, a primarily has been managed under the Magnuson Act authorities. Uh, we adopt by reference um, the regulations as promulgated under the um, the South Atlantic Council. And so my question may be for Roy is, is can you school us or school me on the differences, the nuances between what we may call a complementary fishery management plan uh, versus a joint fishery management plan? And, and I guess let me, let me state my interest at the outset. I uh, certainly think that there are um, a lot of cross-shelf movements. I certainly think that there's a lot to be had for um, for federal involvement in it as well. And I certainly think that um, uh, the accountability measures and the ACLs as promulgated under Magnuson need to be part of COBE management. Roy. Well, I would defer a little bit to staff on some of that. Most of my experience has been with complementary plans, which we've done. And in that case, um, I think the council can operate in their own meeting and go down their path and then the Atlantic States does theirs. But if we were to do a true joint plan, then we would need to have joint meetings and we'd need to each pass the same motions and those kinds of things. Similar to when we um, do a plan amendment of the, of the Coastal Migratory Pelagics Plan and have to meet jointly with the, um, with the uh, Gulf Council. And I think that's the main distinction. I, I'd defer to, to Tony if you have anything to add to that. Tony? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I think there's a couple of things with the um, complementary plans. Oftentimes, like for example, um, Atlantic Herring, we would call that a complementary plan. The um, quotas are typically set by the council, and then the states then deal with those quotas that are set by the council, and there's not a lot of input from the states on those quotas and the ACLs that are attached to those. Um, I think that there is some flexibility around the accountability measures in the sense of how the states just decide to implement measures to meet those quotas within their um, um, groupings. With the joint plans, um, Roy's correct, we have to make um, actions like motions. So then the states have input on those quotas. You're still bound by what the SSC sets for the ABC, but there is input from um, both groups on the overall quota. So how much you're going to take into account for uncertainty, for scientific uncertainty or management uncertainty. Um, with the complementary plans, if the states do decide to do something different than what the council has done, then you have uh, the um, chance that you're going to have different measures, and so then your state and federal permit holders would be fishing on different rules, which sometimes can be problematic depending on what set of regs are different. For example, if you set a different quota, then the federal permit holder would be impacted or the state permit holder would be impacted. Um, I think those are some of the, the bigger ones. It does take a little bit longer for us to get through management documents when they are joint plans because we do need to meet consistently with the, the other council. Um, and then um, I think that's most of the large differences that are there. And on page 8 and 9 of the white paper, it does spell out um, some of, in bullet format what the differences are between the different plans. Um, hopefully that's a little bit helpful as well. 
there other questions? Uh, John and then Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Daniel. Great to see you back here. Um, I just had a question about the data. I mean, the increase in the recreational landings between 2014 and 2015 is enormous. Does the MRIP show a corresponding increase in effort? And at the same time, I saw that the stock assessment actually shows the stock coming down, and yet these catches are just huge. Well, we certainly we certainly don't see any anything in the 2015 landings data that would suggest that there's something wrong in the MRIP landings data stream. So we don't think that there's a glitch there. Um, situations occurred that came together where there were a lot of fish available. Um, and also the fish are trending larger um, in the fishery, um, quite a bit larger actually. So the actual numbers of fish probably aren't as reflective as they would be in previous years um, when the fish were a little bit smaller. Um, but I, I believe, and this is speaking um, to some degree anecdotally because I don't know that the data formally exist, but we, do, we are seeing an increase in the number of trips directed towards um, uh, cobia in the recreational fishery. But we've also seen sort of a shift in how the fishery operates to where it's become far more, at least in the, in the mid-Atlantic region, in the southern, our southern area region, more of a, more of a, a, a hunt and fish fishery as opposed to a bottom fishery. And so we've seen quite an increase in the development of, of tackle and baits directed for large cobia. And so that increase in interest and effort, um, I think, is, is reflective in some of these landings. But clearly you can see in re years previous, it's vacillated around a pretty stable mean. Um, what we'll see this year, um, it would only be speculation. But if we continue, you know, the concern is, is if we continue to exceed that 630,000 pound allowable catch limit, then we continue to run the risk of an overfished condition. Uh, Michelle, I think I had you next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I'll ask for your indulgence since I'm wearing a couple of hats here today. I chair the South Atlantic Council, but I'm also here um, as North Carolina's administrative proxy. Um, so uh, there have been a lot of questions from stakeholders with regard to the MRIP data, and we did have some conversation yesterday during the state director's meeting about um, MRIP estimates. You know, there's been some concern, and there were uh, with regard to black sea bass and bluefish final estimates, and we did ask um, MRIP folks if they could go back and look at if the um, – the re-estimations that were used for those species had any impact on cobia, and it was the answer was very little. I believe it was a drop in something like 28,000 pounds. That said, I think one of the things that, from a council perspective, I am interested in exploring are some of the alternative techniques for um, estimation of harvest that the MRIP staff have been gracious enough to present to the South Atlantic Council's SSC using things like um, an annual estimate of catch multiplied by uh, estimates of effort so that you might be not necessarily getting wave-based estimates, but you might be getting um, annual estimates that would allow for smoothing out of some of these spikier approaches. So there are there were multiple approaches that MRIP staff had um, put forward last fall to RSSC. These were for different species such a, that tend to be rarely intercepted. Um, but I think for a pulse fishery like cobia, some of those might be applicable. So we have encouraged uh, no fisheries MRIP staff to consider development of additional business rules for when those types of techniques might be applied during the MRIP review um, that's gone on. I also wanted to follow up on Mr. Boyle's comments with regard to um, commission involvement in the management of COBIA. I think one of the things that has certainly become clearer if we didn't already know it is the differences in this fishery up and down the coast, you know, Georgia's fishery is different than South Carolina's fishery, is different than North Carolina's fishery, is different than Virginia's fishery. You know, we've just seen in the past few weeks um, a little girl from Maryland who caught a fish that was, you know, half as big again as she was. So I think it certainly lends um, 
support and rationale for the commission becoming involved in cobia management you know i know that i think and and um pat can correct me if i'm wrong but georgia's fishery is pretty much a federal waters fishery south carolina has seen a lot of changes in their inshore versus offshore fisheries over the last seven or eight years you know in north carolina itself we sort of straddle between what virginia's fishery characteristics are versus what um the characteristics are south of us, you know, north of Ocracoke Inlet, it's a different fishery versus south of Ocracoke Inlet. Um, and then Virginia, of course, has a longer season with a peak that's offset by another wave. So I think, you know, the things that we have heard from stakeholders with regard to um, having an equal voice or an equal seat at the table, the commission process offers that with every state having an equal vote and an equal voice. Um, and then the other one of the other major issues that we've heard has been the ability to react to changing conditions within the fishery. And the commission process allows for um, a more nimble and flexible response. Certainly, even though the council, as you'll hear about, is undertaking a framework amendment, and most folks here are familiar with the framework amendment, it's process, it's a shorter process, but it still requires going through federal rulemaking, whereas the commission process allows for um, more rapid changes in regulations. So um, I think for all of those reasons, I would certainly advocate for the commission becoming involved in this. And whenever you're ready, Mr. Chairman, I'm prepared to make a motion with regard to that. Uh, thank you. Let's see if we can exhaust the questions. Joe? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make a comment and follow up with with what uh, Michelle had just said. And I, I think the Council, the South Atlantic Council's framework um, has exhausted <laughs> all of their possible management options. I, I think they've, they've done a, uh, a great job with what they're putting forward with the options for the framework. Um, I'm not sure that that's enough for this fishery since it is so different state to state. I really think, uh, you know, we need to have some decisions made here, um, especially for conservation equivalency that could put the states um, in a bind with, with the current framework. Um, I feel, I, I would feel remiss if I didn't thank the council for all they've done so far. This has been a tough year for a lot of us. And I also want to thank Dr. Crabtree's staff. Um, they've been extremely helpful through all of this and, and just really open to working with us. But I, I do believe it belongs here. Thank you. Roy. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow up on some of the comments. Um, I think the fishery service thinks it is important that the commission take on more of a role in management of um, this fishery. And I think there is a need um, for a commission to develop a, a fishery management plan. I, I don't think any of us want to complicate this any more than we need to um, to achieve our objectives and, and have a successful fishery. Um, but I think we do need to ensure that the states who have important fisheries for Kobe all do have a, a voice in how the fisheries managed. I think flexibility here um, is certainly desirable. Um, so I think more state involvement here. This is, I think, Lewis, 80, 85 percent of the fisheries occurring in, in state waters. And so this is predominantly a state water fishery. And so I think it's appropriate that the states take on um, a greater role in the management of the fishery. So exactly how we get there, you know, the complementary plan sounds like maybe the, the most straightforward way to get to what we need to do, but I'm, I'm open to up their options as well. Um, but I do think we support um, the development of a commission plan of some sort um, and think that's necessary to, to properly manage the fishery. Thank you. <clears throat> if there are no other questions, maybe if we could go backwards about three or four slides here to look at the management options. And then when we get that up there, Michelle, I'd, if you have an, a motion, I'd appreciate that. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I move that the South Atlantic Board recommend to the Policy Board development of a complementary fishery management plan for COBIA. So this would be option one under the plan structure listed. Do we have a second? Robert Boyles? Michelle, would you like to expand on that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I think one of the other, I, I put forward the option for complementary management at this time because as you've heard here, there is, a, I think there is a strong rationale for the commission to become involved in this based on some of the stakeholder concerns with regard to um, adequate representation, being able to be responsive to each state's management needs. But I think stakeholders have all, what we've also heard is that, you know, stakeholders believe that the actions that have occurred as a result of the federal process have led to the situation that they're, that we are in today. And so they don't want to see, they want to see the council fix that um, situation as much as possible. So I think maintaining federal involvement at this time is certainly um, appropriate. Thank you. Before we have any further discussion, we have a member of the public that I think would like to make a comment. Sir, if you come to the microphone and state your name and any affiliation you might have. Thank you. My name is Jonathan French. Uh, I represent a loose collaboration of uh, charter boat captains, tackle shops, and just regular recreational anglers from Virginia and North Carolina. And I'm probably the stakeholder that Dr. Duvall has mentioned has expressed most of those concerns. Um, I'm here uh, to ask for this commission to uh, be very patient and not make a recommendation at this time. And I think Dr. Daniel. Uh, his presentation uh, shows the reason why. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask for the slides to go backwards, but uh, one of the slides mentioned that there is a genetic dividing line uh, at the Florida, Georgia general area. I believe the exact line claimed is uh, slightly south of the Florida, Georgia state line. Um, we have two genetic studies, one of which is from South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, that say that that is hogwash. Uh, uh, and it's an example of throughout this process, information has been presented to the public that at best is sloppy and inconsistent and at worst uh, seems to be downright dishonest and those issues need to be fixed uh, before additional re regulatory bodies come into place. Um, the first of those studies comes from Texas A&M University. It's peer reviewed and it's published in the uh, uh, the North American Journal of Aquaculture that says that cobia sampled from the coastal waters of Virginia, Mississippi, and Louisiana were genetically homogeneous based on essays of microsatellite genotypes and MD uh, DNA haplotypes. Uh, the second study, again, I referenced from South Carolina, says that offshore migratory fish are genetically identical throughout Gulf and Atlantic waters. There is no dividing line. However, that study does acknowledge the existence of an anomaly genetically in South Carolina that's a byproduct of a failed stocking effort and aquaculture project started in 2004 by the state. And I would like to reference specifically from that study, no fish collected outside of South Carolina were identified as South Carolina stocked fish. Therefore, our evaluation of hatchery contribution represents their contribution to South Carolina's cobia populations. What that means means is that the fish that are the genetic anomaly and that were used for the justification for the zone plant uh, split in Amendment 20, uh, 20B in the fisheries management plan, uh, those fish don't move. So South Carolina's actions in order to uh, reduce pressure on that localized fishery, uh, I would deem them to be appropriate but should not be impactful uh, outside of that area. Those were the reasons used to justify the zone split and the end result was 880,000 pounds of quota that belong, uh, 
were carved out of the Atlantic Management Zone and given to East Florida, which is now part of the Gulf Management Zone, uh, that 880,000 pounds was given even though uh, the average catch in East Florida for the years 2013 through 2015 was only 427,000 pounds. So essentially, uh, East Florida got double uh, what they normally catch, and at least in that three-year period. During the same time period, uh, North Carolina and Virginia by themselves caught 550,000 pounds, yet only 630,000 pounds was carved out of the entire area from the Georgia state line up to New York. Uh, that's not fair. That's not equitable. That's a violation uh, at the absolute root, not best science available, not fair and equitable impact, not a fair and equitable impact of the resource. And the result is, even if you accept the MRAP data is accurate, which most of uh, the folks that I try to represent uh, say is absolute malarkey, uh, but if even if you accept it as being accurate, you look at the standard deviation of the catch averages for the last 10 years, and 2015 is the only year that goes above the standard deviation. It's one of only three years that go above the appropriate ACL, which is the ACL that includes East Florida because, as I pointed out earlier, the genetic rationale for the zone split uh, is not grounded in science. Uh, and with that being the case, uh, we wouldn't have a crisis. This is a manufactured crisis that, frankly, uh, to use a term that us dumb folks are familiar with because of the recent election cycle, this has been gerrymandered. And I would recommend that this council, I'm sorry, this commission wait until South Atlantic conduct a new stock assessment to reconsider some of this other scientific information and determine whether or not there needs to be any additional management. Um, one other point that was kind of, obs obs uh, kind of brushed over uh, in Dr. Daniel's presentation is what North Carolina and Virginia has done. Uh, that catch average Average occurred when North Carolina allowed a two fish per person uh, limit with fish at 33 inches apiece in 2015. Uh, North Carolina initially dropped to a one fish limit for this year uh, and that was only deemed to be worth a couple of additional days of the season. So now North Carolina has gone to a four fish boat limit uh, for charter boat anglers, a two fish boat limit for recreational boat anglers who can only possess a fish on Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, which I regard as a horrible violation of equal protection, and pier anglers can keep one fish per Per day, all at 37 inches fork length rather than 33. So there's going to be a significant drop in the catch from those steps. Virginia has had a one fish per person limit for an extended period of time, and that's one of the reasons we regard the population as thriving in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Virginia has managed carefully and ended up getting punished for it. Uh, Virginia, in response to all this, did not comply with federal law either. However, uh, the uh, commission in Virginia made the decision to drop to a two-fish boat limit. Only one fish over 51 inches could be kept, and uh, Virginia anglers are only allowed to use nets. So if you factor in those changes, or even if you adopted a one-fish per person limit across the states in the management area, and you look at the trended data out over 10 years, there's no reason to reasonably assume that if the ACL is set at the 2014 level where it belongs with East Florida Key West as the appropriate dividing line, which is appropriate based on the genetic science available and the tagging data available, there is no reason whatsoever to expect that a one fish per person limit would not produce uh, numbers well beneath the ACL. And we have argued this till we're blue in the face. We've been told why we're wrong, and yet the information presented is at the best confusing and misleading, and at worst, it feels like we're being lied to. And fisheries management will not work if the public feels like they can't trust the folks around this table and the folks around those councils and commissions as honest dealers. I the folks I represent are furious. They're independent. They're not well organized, but they are mad as I'll get out what they observe on a daily basis basis does not align with the information you've been presented, and I regard the presentation that Dr. Daniel just gave to you as dishonest. 
I hope you all read it closely, and I would beg and plead that another hearing is held so we have an opportunity to present this other publicly available, peer-reviewed, published genetics informa genetic information, and then you make up your own minds. But don't feed this bull you've been handed. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, do we have any further discussion of the motion on the board? Tom. I really didn't want to comment on this since New Jersey is a very small player. We have some recreational and mental catches and some commercial catches. But I really am not happy with complementary plans. In the same way, I'm not happy with joint plans. I mean, the only complementary plan that I've been involved with is winter flounder, and that really works horribly. You know, as, as we can put in the commission, we put in a one-fish bag limit and a 50-pound trip limit, and, the, and GARPO, for some unknown reason, allows 5,000-pound trip limits on our, on our boats, commercial that fish in federal waters, which meant that in four or five trips, they would catch more fish than our commercial fishermen in state waters would catch in 30 years, and same thing with the recreational. So they didn't ask for our guidance and things like that. I'm also concerned about the, uh, uh, I didn't see the PEs on the recreational data. I was wondering, because I'm not that familiar with the fishery, when the red snapper fishery was uh, constrained, did that basically put a lot more effort on the cobia fishery? So that's the questions that I haven't been answered, because I can see that happen with, when, we ha when we basically, you know, we started losing summer flounder, and regulations went where you have to do 20 to one to catch and release, then it put more pressure on, more people became striped bass fishermen. So that's my other concern here. So I'm just trying to look at the data that I'm not that familiar with. So my concern, I have a problem with a complementary plan. Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the motion, obviously having seconded it. I remind the board that uh, in South Carolina, uh, our state waters in what is now known as the Southern Cobia Management Zone closed May the 1st to protect what we believe to be as a spawning aggregation. And because we adopt federal regulations by reference, South Carolina anglers have not had access to the Cobia fishery since June the 20th of this year. Eighty percent of the catch caught in state waters, I think this is a species that screams for interjurisdictional management. Uh, with respect to our fishermen and our anglers uh, to points north, um, their decisions, their commissions, uh, which we respect, um, those anglers in Virginia and North Carolina remain, have access to the cobia fishery. My anglers in South Carolina are asking me um, why that is. So I support the motion and think it's something that we should uh, move forward to the policy board. Thank you. Adam. Can we get any comment here today about the question of the DNA demarcation line? We heard that the gentlemen and those groups involved have gotten a response as to why they're wrong. Can we hear that on the record here today? Dr. Carmichael? So the genetics information that was, genetics that was available at the time the assessment done was studied in, in quite a bit of detail. And then the samples by uh, South Carolina were, during the assessment process, there was some additional sampling of, done for them as well. Now, the study that uh, Mr. French cited by Dr. Gold that was done had a relatively small sample size. They looked at the Virginia offshore. They looked at Mississippi, Louisiana, and Taiwan versus the Darden study, the South Carolina study, looked at inshore, offshore, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, all of them inshore, offshore. And they were kind of two different purposes of the studies. The South Carolina and Darden study was to try and define the stock boundaries as they were, and really started out in the case of South Carolina to try and understand the inshore components, you know, like the Port Royal population, or whether that was its own separate population, what was happening to the stocked fish. And then as the result of those efforts began to realize that there were multiple stock units along the coast that, that had various degrees of mixing and interactions, and then look closer at what the relationship was to 
the Florida stock and the Gulf stock and maybe where those lines were. The gold study that was cited came along later and was really geared toward aquaculture and trying to understand relationships between different stocks. That's why it included Taiwan. And one of the things that I found interesting about that is that the gold study that was cited used Virginia offshore. They had 35 fish, and they had some difficulties in telling whether or not those were truly different, distinct from, say, the fish in the Gulf of Mexico where they studied. Um, and, and one of the problems that, that certainly that raises is that the Darden study that was done in 08 and 09 and then added more stocks in 2012 really made an effort to collect the fish when the Virginia inshore fish were inshore because what they've realized is sometimes those inshore stocks were mixing with this offshore component, particularly off of North Carolina and Virginia. So the Darden studies, for example, couldn't establish the, the North Carolina fish as being distinct from either the fish in the Virginia inshore or the fish that were farther south in the South Atlantic. So, you know, there's a, there's a mixing that goes on, and you guys work with striped bass and other stuff. Y'all are well aware of all that kind of stuff that was going on sort of off of the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay and stuff. And so, of course, you know, genetics being such they are, that's not always the be-all and end-all, and there's sample size issues and trying to truly understand what a distinct functioning productive population unit is. Um, when the stock boundaries were drawn for the assessment, they took all that into account, and they realized that it was difficult to draw a line on the southern boundary, which is the case with many of our stocks, and they recommended a pragmatic choice of drawing the line at the, the Georgia-Florida boundary. And I think, you know, we, we know in terms of dealing with data sets and things of that nature and regulations, it's often you know, if, if you can go to a boundary that exists and you don't have clear distinction as to, you know, whether it should maybe be 150 miles north or south of that, you know, it's going to be much more efficient to use that existing boundary. Now, of course, that has raised a lot of questions as we've looked into that. And as Lewis mentioned, we're going to have a stock ID workshop coming up in late 2017. Cobia is at the top of that list and will absolutely be considered in preparation for the next assessment. And um, Florida FWC is looking into this now. They're doing some tagging and they're trying to look at movements and other things to really get better resolution of that Florida component to try to decide, you know, where should the line be? Is it possible that the South Atlantic stock that we call it, or the Atlantic stock should cons go down to maybe Daytona Beach as opposed to being at the line. And the reality was there weren't a lot of studies of fish in that area. There weren't a lot of samples of fish in that area when this was done for the last assessment with the data through uh, 2012. So there's a lot going on now, and I say this will definitely be looked at in the next assessment. And there may be more genetic studies, perhaps, or more samples that come to light when we get around to the next assessment, and that will all be looked at. So our thought is to look at this population and try to decide what are the functioning population units. You know, is there a, a Chesapeake Bay stock that should be considered similar to the Port Royal stock? Perhaps. And, and if that's the case, then I would think, you know, the commission involvement in the management would certainly become an even stronger position. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since I made the motion, I'm obviously in support of it. I did just want to follow up on John's response to Adam's question. I don't believe the gold paper was available at the time that the data workshop for this species occurred. So, you know, there's got to be a deadline for information to be considered in a data workshop for, um, for a species to be assessed so that information came to light afterward. It certainly has played into um, the council's request that COBIA be at the top of the list for this stock ID workshop that's occurring. You know, and I think if it was up to the council, we would keep all stock boundaries at the nice, neat jurisdictional boundaries that we have between the South Atlantic and the Mid-Atlantic and between the Gulf and the South Atlantic. And unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. And so the council has had to respond on many occasions to these designations of biological stock boundaries. We have one, an action that is going through right now for King Mackerel, where the mixing, the mixing zone was thought to be pretty much most of the east coast of the Florida Peninsula and part, part of the way around the uh, west coast of the Florida Peninsula and the most recent stock assessment for King Mackerel has determined that the mixing zone between the Gulf and Atlantic stocks is actually now centered around the Florida Keys. So 
we are at the whim of the science, you know, to some extent, but we are trying to be as responsive as possible to, you know, the very valid concerns that stakeholders have brought forth on this. Thank you. Unless I see further interest in discussion, I will read the motion. Move the South Atlantic Board recommend to the Policy Board for the development of a complementary fishery management plan for Cobia. Motion by Dr. Duvall, seconded by Mr. Boyles. I'll give you just a moment to talk to each other, and then we will ask for a vote. Okay. All of those in favor of the motion as read, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, like sign. Abstentions? No votes. Motion passes. Okay, next agenda item is, excuse me, but where did Dr. Daniel go? Oh, you're right there. I'm sorry. We have another part to, we have another part to this. I was trying to get yeah, there Yes, if you go back to the presentation, when we can get there. The next slide talks about oops, talks about the board structure options, Mr. Chairman. Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd make a motion that uh, we recommend to the ISFMP Policy Board that the South Atlantic State Federal Fisheries Management Board be the appropriate venue for uh, development of a COBIA interstate fishery management plan. Is there a second? Spot. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm supportive of this motion. I think. Um, and I struggled with, you know, what is the best approach here. Um, I think that if if current situations are any indicator, it's highly likely that uh, harvest of cobia north of Virginia is probably going to increase down the road. So I think it's appropriate that the other states that are currently on the board have the opportunity to participate um, in the development of a fishery management plan. Thank you. Any further discussion of this issue? As soon as it's on the board, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we're doing. Move to recommend to the policy board that the South Atlantic Board is the appropriate venue to develop the FMP for COBIA. Motion by Mr. Boyles and seconded by Mr. Woodward. Is there any objection to this motion? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. Now, Tony wants to talk a little bit about uh, framework four for COBIA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, we had a request from the South Atlantic Council to give some recommendations or comments on their framework for, as Michelle said, that they are undergoing um, a management action that looks at COBIA. And framework four is just addressing the Atlantic Migratory Group um, for COBIA in, within the document. And the document is considering changes um, to ensure longer future seasons and allow um, fair access to COBIA for fishermen in all states. 
the public comment will um, go through um, September, which is when their council meeting is to address this issue. Um, if we have written comments that get in by August 19th, they will be a part of the meeting materials, but they will accept comments after that time frame. Um, the actions that are in the document include recreational harvest limits, but the bag and vessel limits, uh, modifying the recreational minimum size, modifying the accountability measures for both the commercial, uh, for the recreational fishery, and then establishing a commercial trip limit for Atlantic Cobia. There's also action within this document to look at the recreational fishing year. Um, the council was given guidance after the document was put out that they have to do um, an amendment in order to do this, but they're still seeking comment on the um, on the fishing year, just in case they decide to change the actual season um, through management action. Um, uh, so again, like I said, it's just looking at the Atlantic Migratory Group. So this is the management uh, from Georgia northward. The current limits are for federal waters are 33 inches and two fish per person per day. And all of the um, management scenarios and the impacts of those scenarios are based off of these um, coast-wide measures, not based on the state-specific measures that been, have been put in place um, recently by some of the states. Let's skip through some of these slides, just in interest of time. So first is looking at modifying the recreational management measures for COBIA. There's a couple of things that are looking at here. First is looking at the um, possession limit. There are alternatives to not modify or to have a one person per fish per person per one fish per person per day, and that is the preferred alternative. There's also looking at a vessel limit. That vessel limit has options ranging from one to six um, fish per vessel per day, and the preferred alternative is three fish per vessel per day. In addition, they're looking at modifying the size limit for recreational harvest. Um, the current is 33 inches. The document looks at modifying um, for anywhere from 33 to 50 inches. The preferred alternative is 36 inches within the document. Um, and this figure here shows um, what the preferred alternatives would get you in terms of how much um, season you would have. And remember that this is a coastwide measure um, comparison, um, and it assumes that the fishing date start would be January 1. And so those two preferred alternatives would pull the season through almost the end of July. Um, it's predicted that it would go through July 20th. Next is looking at modifying the recreational fishing year for Atlantic Cobia. Again, this action would actually have to be done through an amendment, but one is to not modify. The preferred alternative is to have the fishing year be from May 1st through April 30th. Alternative three would be a June 1st through May 31st season, and the last alternative is an April 1st through March 31st season. Um, and this figure here shows um, the recreational landings um, by month and where you see the spikes and uh, the landings occurring is mostly th um, March through um, September, October for the waves in MREP. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I'm going to skip through these um, tables, Max. And we're going straight to the accountability measures. All right. Um, so then looking at how the council is suggesting modifying their accountability measures. Um, the current accountability measure for COBIA has the, the recreational ACL is reduced by the total overage in the next year. And that's based on the most recent three years of data. So you do some averaging out to determine how much of the overage has to be taken out of the ACL in the following year. In the commercial fishery, the council closes harvest when the quota has been met, and if any overages occur, those quotas come out of the next year's um, quota. And Michelle I'm, is correcting me, and I asked her to do this. Um, 
Thank you, Tony. So just a quick correction on the recreational side of things. So the current accountability measure requires a shortened season the following year if the total annual, if the recreational annual catch limit and the total annual catch limit, so recreational and commercial combined, is exceeded, the length of the season will be reduced the following fishing year. If the stock is overfished, which Cobia is not, then you would also have a reduction in the annual catch limit. So right now we're just under a situation of having had a reduced season. Sorry, Tony. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. So the preferred alternative for um, making changes to the accountability measure is that um, if the recreational landings exceed the recreational ACL, um, landings would be monitored for a persistent in the increase in landings. And the re um, there would be a reduction in the length of the season to ensure that the recreational landings met the ACT but are not exceeding the ACL in the next year. Um, and this would be based on one year's uh, of data, not using the averaging that is in the current um, accountability measure. The next um, option is uh, to look at um, reducing the recreational ACL in the following year, similar to what is in the current measures, but it would be based on the one year of data, not the three year. And then lastly is looking at um, having in-season closures, so it gives um, the ability to close the recreational sector for the remainder of the fishing year if the um, ACL has been met or it's projected to have been met. And then lastly is to modify the um, recreational vessel limit for the following fishing year um, to ensure that the, um, the recreational landings meet the ACT but don't exceed the, the ACL and it's based on the one year as well. Um, so for all of these recreational accountability measures, um, you can see that some of the big change would be instead of using the three-year average, you'd use the one year. And just note that the council could use more than one of these accountability measures at a time in order to ensure that um, there wouldn't be an overage in the following year. And then lastly is to look at potentially establishing a commercial trip limit for Cobia. Um, the current trip limit is two fish per person per day. Um, there's an alternative to establish a commercial trip limit of um, two person per day and the trip limit would decrease to one fish when 75% of the commercial ACL had been met. Uh, another is to establish a six fish per person vessel per day and the trip limit would decrease to three fish per vessel per day when 75% of the ACL had been met. And then lastly is to look at two fish per person per day with no more than six fish per vessel per day and the trip limit would decrease to one fish per person per day with no more than three per vessel per day when 75% of the ACL has been met. Um, and this is uh, a summary of um, the estimated month when the actual Atlantic Cobia commercial landings reach 75% of the commercial ACL and the um, current commercial ACL of um, 50,000 pounds. And so you can see that um, in the most recent year, that would have been in July um, when 75% was met and then when it actually hit the ACL was August. And that is all. Um, and I think that we can either do one of two things here, Mr. Chairman, is that we can either get a, just a general consensus that the, the board wants to comment and then those comments can come back to me and then we can draft a letter and send it back to the board for their review or, um, or we can uh, give the comments here today and then send the letter back to the board. Uh, first of all, so what's the will of the group? Do we want to make comments on this? 
Madam. So I won't be cobia specific, but I will draw on the lessons learned with recreational management in conjunction with the Mid-Atlantic with summer flounder, black sea bass, and scup. Having gone through that at the council level, one of the early iterations of accountability measures included in-season closure authority, and that has since been taken out and deemed just wasn't practicable. And I would recommend that same course of action for recreational fisheries, including cobia, unless somebody can make some very clear case why the recreational cobia fishery is that much different than other recreational fisheries. I would also draw on our experience in the variability interannually of the MRIP data and the danger of responding to a single year's worth of data uh, and some type of multi-year. Currently, we're using a three-year rolling average at the council level. I would encourage uh, the board to interact with the council and recommend a similar course of action to reduce that interannual variability. Michelle. Thank you, Adam. I very much appreciate those comments. I think the in-season closure option is in there because it's sort of consistent with what we have for some of our the account accountability measures for some of our other species. But um, we actually don't have in-season closures for recreational cobia right now, specifically for the very reasons that you've cited. Um, it's in there as a reasonable alternative for public comment. I think with regard to the three-year moving average, um, that's what we have currently, and that three-year moving average resets in the year that a new, a new ACL is rendered from a stock assessment. So that's the situation that we had in 2015. We got a new annual catch limit. Um, so the three-year moving average started again with 2015. So you were only comparing 2015 landings with the 2015 ACL. If we maintain that three-year moving average, anglers are going to continue to be penalized for the next two years by having to include that 1.5 million pound spike in the following two years. So that's, I just wanted to provide some rationale for why the council was looking at moving to a one-year comparison so that if for 2016 harvest has been constrained to the limit, you would only be comparing 2016 landings to a 2016 ACL. You would not be penalizing anglers by inclusion of that 2015 spike in the three-year moving average. I think the other thing um, with the accountability measures was the council was looking at trying to not have some type of season closure by inclusion of the option that allows for a reduction in the vessel limit as a potential option to be used possibly in combination with a shortened season, but to try to offset any shortened season that might need to occur. So I just wanted to provide some context for some of those options in there. Thank you. So obviously each state can provide comments to the to the council as they as they see fit i think the question before us is is do we want as a commission do we want to provide comments on this framework for robert thank you mr chairman um i'm not sure we could get consensus on what to say and so my sense is let's just look at this at, at commenting um, individually. Again, I think that's one of the challenges we have in terms of moving interstate management. We don't have that yet. Um, I wouldn't expect my views on Kobe or South Carolina's views on Kobe to be congruent with those of Virginia's necessarily. And so I'm, I'm, I think that'd be a futile exercise. I'd recommend we just move on. Joe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I agree with that. I, I just want to reiterate that I've, um, I'm glad to see all the work that the Council put into this and in, and in bringing so many options forward, although I think it would be very difficult for us to, to have consensus on all of them right now. But uh, there was an obvious realization by everyone that, that there needed to be more options within the accountability measures, and I think this is a you know, big step forward for that. Thanks. Michelle. 
Just one final thought. I agree with Robert, but if there are folks, like Adam offered some very constructive comments, I think if there are folks sitting around the table who do have thoughts that, specific thoughts that they may want to provide to Tony, and Tony could certainly just, you know, compile, I mean, recognizing that this isn't consensus, but, you know, certainly any um, constructive criticism of what's in the document would be appreciated by any individuals around the table who choose to do so. Thank you. Is everybody all right with that approach, that send comments to Tony that she can compile? Okay. It looks like, it looks like that's what we're going to do. Um, it is now lunchtime. Let's... Um, we obviously can't get done in the next five minutes. Let's break. Let's break until about 12.30? No? Um, well, it's 12.20. 1220. And we may have Jeff start giving his presentation on sort of what the Red Drum Working Group is doing while you guys are eating, and then by the time you're done eating, you can start asking him questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I'll be giving an update on the red drum tasks that this board tasked the red drum technical committee and stock assessment subcommittee with at the May meeting. Uh, just to refresh your memory, the tasks were to look at the appropriateness of biolog the current biological reference points for red drum, which are spawning potential ratios. Uh, similar to that, look at f base reference points and the appropriateness of those for just a juvenile-based uh, F reference point. Uh, evaluate the validity of age-based models for red drum given data limitations and the life history of, that spe of this species. Uh, conduct uh, continuity runs of the statistical catch at age model that was uh, developed for CDAR-18, the previous benchmark assessment and to uh, evaluate the tag return rates and the tag recapture data as it's used in the stock synthesis models. Uh, so just a summary of the meetings that we've had since the May meeting. We did have a conference call with the commissioners to uh, clarify some of the questions we had on the tasks and sort of what the goals of the tasks were. And we've had a series of conference calls and webinars with the technical committee and stock assessment and subcommittee to go over these tasks. Uh, we do have a webinar planned uh, for the week of August 15th. Uh, and then also uh, where we'll get most of our in-person work uh, and discussions done is at a in-person meeting at the fall TC week, which is September 12th through the 16th. And we don't have that uh, to be determined, the exact date and time for that meeting. Um, and I'll spare the uh, full language here, uh, just in a um, matter of time, but the first was uh, biological reference points and evaluating the appropriateness of uh, spawning potential ratios for red drum and whether or not the 30% target and, uh, or 30% threshold and 40% uh, target are suitable goals for red drum. Uh, so the progress to date for this task, uh, we started out and felt that it would be useful to uh, go uh, and summarize the uh, theory and use of spawning potential, potential ratios uh, as reference points and how that relates to uh, red drum and their life history. Uh, and that was provided in the summary uh, and meeting materials. Uh, we also did discuss that an overfished reference point is still contingent on uh, spawning stock biomass estimates out of uh, the models, whether that be the uh, stock synthesis models in the current assessment, um, or as I'll get to, the catch it age model that was used in CDR 18. Uh, and it was noted that there is the need for some additional information in addition to these F based reference points, especially if we are lacking a uh, SSB overfished. Uh, reference point. And so the group kind of centered around the need for a recruitment reference point likely derived from uh, an index-based uh, survey uh, under a stoplight framework or a traffic light framework, as, as you may recognize, to supplement the F-based reference points, uh, whether those be the spawning potential ratios or uh, 
we are tasked also at looking at just juvenile F reference points. So moving forward, we are currently working also on some simulations of looking at the red drum stock uh, fish to an equilibrium state under different uh, spawning potential ratios and uh, how that will impact recruitment in the long term to help inform uh, our, uh, the group's final decision on the SPR reference points for red drum. And so the uh, ultimate goal of that will be the final recommendation on SPR reference points and the appropriate threshold and targets uh, for both stocks. And then also to supplement that, as I mentioned, we will provide a recommendation for an index-based recruitment reference point. For the F-base F -base reference point, this was to look at uh, an F-base reference point strictly for the juvenile harvest. Uh, and we later did confirm on our call with, with some of the commissioners that that harvest uh, is also to include the uh, assumed B2 mortality of the fish that are discarded in the recreational fishery. Uh, so what the group has done here has, uh, they've evaluated the relationship between uh, the current overfishing reference point, SPR, and uh, juvenile fishing mortality estimates. And also developed a list of pros and cons or, or advantages and disadvantages of using a juvenile F-based reference point for, for management of the red drum stocks. Uh, and these two figures here just show that uh, evaluation of the relationship between the juvenile fishing mortality estimates and uh, SPR. And on the, uh, the left figure for the southern stock and the right figure for the northern stock, uh, the SPR estimates out of the stock synthesis model are on the uh, y-axis and on the x-axis are the fishing mortality estimates for age uh, zero to five fish. Uh, and you can see that there is a, a tight relationship between those two measures of fishing mortality. Um, but one of the issues that we are currently debating for this is uh, similar to the issues for spawning potential ratios and escapement that have been discussed in the past and that is what is the appropriate level or reference point of fishing mortality for this type of uh, metric to uh, manage the stock on. So moving forward with that in mind, uh, again we will be having discussions at our in-person meeting but the final product um, for this task is a final recommendation on the appropriateness of a juvenile F-based reference point uh, and if it is deemed uh, appropriate to provide uh, a recommendation for what that, uh, that reference point is. And uh, as I mentioned before, the group does feel that there needs to be this uh, supplemental um, index-based recruitment type reference point uh, to supplement any type of uh, fishing mortality reference point. Uh, the third task was to evaluate uh, the validity of age-based models for red drum given uh, some of the data limitations for, these, for the species and also the life history of that species. Uh, so what the group has done here is we've summarized the potential concerns uh, about data limitations for age structured models uh, for red drum. Um, we did discuss some other types of models, most notably a, a biomass dynamics model or a surplus production type model. And the TC and SAS do recommend against uh, any type of this model as, as inappropriate for, for red drum. Um, so moving forward, the, the product right now as we have uh, coming for this task is a description of the potential implications that the data limitations uh, that are currently in place for red drum could have on age structured modeled es estimates. Um, and I will note that the, the TC and SAS on our calls have struggled the most with, with this task and what the, the goal of this task is. Um, and so if, if what I've presented here is, is the kind of the, what we see as the final product coming forward for, for this task is uh, agreeable amongst the, the board, then we'll keep uh, moving forward on that. Um, but if there is feedback on kind of uh, additional information or thoughts on uh, what the board would like to see to address this task. We, uh, we are kind of seeking that today. 
the fourth task here is uh, updated continuity runs of the catch at age model that was used in CDAR 18. Uh, if you recall to the presentation of the assessment at the May meeting, there are some um, pretty major differences between the estimates out of CDAR 18 and the uh, new stock synthesis models that were put forth in the, the most recent assessment. Um, so what we've spent most of our time working on for th this task is just updating the model inputs to align them as closely as possible to the inputs going into the stock synthesis three models um, for the, the sake of comparing those results more closely and from the updated continuity models through 2013. Um, and I, I just made a note here that the tag recapture components will be unchanged from CDR 18. Uh, the group uh, views this as a, a major uh, task that would not be able to be accomplished before uh, the annual meeting when the, the board would like to review uh, the work on all these tasks. So moving forward, once those models are run, uh, we will put together a comparison uh, of the catch at age model estimates and the stock synthesis model estimates and we'll provide a description of those discrepancies and the, the likely reasons for those discrepancies. Uh, and the SAS, uh, stock SAS and subcommittee will provide a final recommendation on the utility of that catch it age model that was used in CR18 for management advice and the caveats that go with, with that recommendation. Um, but I, I do want to note here that uh, the group uh, sees the primary goal of this task in comparing what the implications are from switching from the old catch it model to the stock synthesis model. Uh, if the board would like to consider the catch it age model as a model for management advice, uh, there would likely need to be additional work to be done following the annual meeting uh, and uh, the group believes that that would need uh, a peer review of that model because there would be some additional data streams going into the model and likely some uh, modifications to the model relative to how it was configured for CDAR 18. Uh, and the last uh, task was to evaluate the tag return rates that are used in the stock synthesis model uh, and the tag recapture data and, and make a recommendation on how, uh, if any changes should be made on how that's incorporated in the stock synthesis models. Uh, so for the southern stock synthesis model, there were two sensitivity runs done, uh, one with a lower uh, reporting rate and one with a higher reporting rate, 60% reporting rate was the higher value and an 18% for a lower value. And for the northern model, there was a likelihood profile conducted over um, several fixed values for the recreational harvest fleet reporting rate. Uh, and these are just some figures to show uh, the preliminary results of those, those analyses. Uh, in the upper left hand corner is for the southern model. And on the uh, y-axis is the static SPR estimates out of the stock synthesis model uh, over the time series. And the, the red line is the sensitivity run with the southern model uh, with the reporting rate fixed at 60%. When that's allowed to be estimated within the model, it's estimated at about 30%. So it's about doubling the reporting rate uh, as it is estimated in that model. And you can see that those estimates fall very similar to the CDAR 18 SPR estimates, uh, which are the green dashed line. The black line is the base uh, southern stock synthesis model and the SPR estimates out of that model. The black dashed line is the stock synthesis <coughs> model without the tag recapture data included and you can see it has a, a little effect on the overall uh, SPR estimates. And the blue line is the sensitivity run with the reporting rate fixed at 18%. Uh, and you can see that the SPR does decrease when fixing that value at a lower rate than what's estimated in the base model. In the lower right hand corner is the likelihood profile uh, done for the northern model uh, with the change in the likelihood on the x-axis and the 
uh, re recreational harvest reporting rate on the y or on the x-axis. I'm sorry, and the change in likelihood is on the y-axis. And this was profiled over fixed values from 10 percent all the way up to 95 percent. Uh, and if you recall, that model was estimating a reporting rate around 10 percent. And what we're looking for here in this figure is uh, just a smooth convex shape uh, that comes to a minimum point at the best estimate out of the model. Uh, as you can see here, that's not what we're seeing. Uh, this model, uh, when the reporting rate is fixed, uh, estimates a, a similar solution up to about a reporting rate of 50 percent and at that point the model finds a very different solution and jumps to that solution instead of a, a smooth kind of transition to that as you increase the reporting rate. Uh, and this is indic indicative of uh, some stability issues within the model when that tag recapture data is included and the reporting rate is fixed. So moving forward, uh, another idea and thought that the group had and is, is looking into currently is uh, evaluating the tag recapture data that was used in the stock synthesis model but in standalone, standalone um, uh, software, uh, most notably the, the MARC program which is used to look at tag recapture data uh, to get a feel for uh, what that model would estimate from the tag recapture data given a similar reporting rate that's being estimated in the stock synthesis model. Uh, and that will help us inform how that stock synthesis model is um, estimating those, those tag recapture uh, <coughs> parameters. And then uh, from that work we'll come up with a final recommendation on how to treat the tag recapture data in the stock synthesis models and if there are any changes that need to be made relative to how they are presented in the uh, assessment at the May meeting. Uh, and so that's just a quick summary on the work we've been doing for these tasks and if there are any questions I, I can take those now. Questions? Spud. Thank you Jeff and I, I certainly want to extend my appreciation to the hard work that you and everybody else has been doing on our behalf. This one's a you know, a challenge and, and I know everybody's busy and <clears throat> we certainly appreciate the attention to detail. A, a question that uh, I've been asked is whether there would be any value to doing an SS3 run with the data from the previous statistical catch at age model. Would, would that be informative in, in any manner because I think you know one of the things we're struggling with is is what we're seeing as a model output a function of the, of the inputs or is it the methodology? So that's, that's a question I've been asked is whether there would be some value to doing that. And so we did try and address that as closely as we could with uh, some sensitivity runs in the assessment. There were what we kind of called our catch at age alternative model runs and those were where we did go back and we used the input data um, as closely as we could from CDAR 18 within stock synthesis. Uh, and looked at the, the model results from that model relative to the base models and uh, the model results were very similar. So that was a sensitivity that we did look at um, but it didn't have a major impact on the model uh, even though we were looking at uh, an age structure of uh, zero to six plus which was uh, comparable to what was looked at in CDAR 18. So, um, what our uh, take home from that was was that, that that was not a major implication in how uh, we are m making the transition from the CDR18 catch at age model to the stock synthesis model. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Uh, also on the, <clears throat> the task related to the validity of age based models, uh, I, I think at least personally what I'm looking for there is that we know we have data source limitations that are that are unavoidable and, and very difficult to mitigate because of management measures and uh, onogenetic shifts in habitat preferences of the fish, out migration into the ocean, a, a variety of things that we've been plagued with since we've been trying to do quantitative assessments of this species. And so 
what I was looking for was, you know, just a very pragmatic assessment of giving all, given all those limitations and the uncertainties that come along with trying to fill the empty spaces, you know, it is an age-based model the only choice we have? And, and I see that there's been some analysis of alternatives that were rejected, uh, but I think the thing that's troubling us is that we, we continue to struggle to fill in, uh, you know, the empty boxes. You know, when you've got a cohort uh, recruits to the fishery, you basically get to quantify its abundance effectively for a couple, three years, and then it's it's gone where you can't really get to it. And even in our best efforts to assess the adult stock, we still end up with fragmented data. And so is there something else, or is this what we're stuck with? And so I think, I think we are on the same page as far as what we're pro uh, providing and putting forth for, to address this task, which is um, a more detailed description of what those data limitations are and how those could potentially affect model estimates from a model uh, structure that we used in stock synthesis. Um, but we will also include our, our thoughts and recommendations on um, other model types uh, in addition to the, the age-based uh, models that are currently used. Any other questions? Uh, hearing none, I guess there's more to come. We'll have more of this information in, when we meet up north in the end of October. Uh, if you are ready, Jeff, we can talk about the progress on the spot and croaker. Oh, nope. I just wanted to reiterate what Jeff had talked about in terms of moving forward with the, um, the different model types and that if we get to at the annual meeting the point where the board wants to utilize information that some of these models may require peer review for us to use it for management and so I just want to make sure that that would mean that we couldn't move forward until after we had that peer review and I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. Any questions or issues with that? Lynn. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Tony. That was on my mind. So it sounds like um, if in October the board decides to move forward with outputs from the statistical catch at age, that it may need a peer review. And so then I just wonder for clarification, would, would, a, would that assessment then uh, take the place of uh, what are we dealing with at that point? Are we dealing with two peer reviewed assessments that we're, we're considering in tandem or are we, viewing, are we considering the one, the more recent science than the other? I'm going to toss that question to my good friend Pat Camfield <laughs> to answer. Thanks very much. Um, the my suggestion would be that you put together the whole package for peer review. Um, given the evolution of the red drum uh, stock assessment models that we've gone through from CDAR 18 uh, to present and possibly an additional type of model, um, you'd want to put forward the, the whole package. Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not a question, just a comment. Um, our uh, trammel net surveys, you know, are suggesting a, um, a real issue. We are not getting year ones showing up in out years. Um, we have strong interest in South Carolina to, uh, to make some management adjustments. Um, and so I find myself in this rather precarious position of wanting to be informed by the, uh, the stock assessment. So um, I appreciate what Tony offered in terms of if we have other questions, this might just push this further and further out. I, I will just put a marker, you know, from our perspective, we have reason to be concerned in South Carolina with um, what we're seeing in our uh, trammel net survey. We have some constituents who are um, um, very concerned about it. <clears throat> And um, I, I'm flummoxed in terms of a, a potential management response when uh, our um, uh, release rate is reported at uh, somewhere north of 80 percent. And so it's uh, got me in a little quandary. So I would just urge us to, to get it right, 
to the degree we can. And I'll echo Spud's comments, Jeff, um, to you and to all the members of the Technical Committee and the Stock Assessment Subcommittee. Appreciate your efforts with this. Um, but uh, we want to get it right, but, uh, but just know for the board that we've got some strong interests uh, from South Carolina to um, make some management changes. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to point out that although we want to get it right, the more, the more that we task this group with doing things that are going to be, there's an issue of funding and an issue of time, and so therefore the more things that we drag this out, long, the longer it is, there are going to be fewer things that we can do for the other species, and I think we need to be mindful of that also. Are there any other questions before we go on to the next agenda item? Uh, seeing none, uh, Jeff, it's still your show, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I just have a, a quick update for the board on the progress of the um, spot and Atlantic Croker stock assessments uh, that are currently underway. Uh, we do have our second stock assessment workshop scheduled for next week. Uh, it's Tuesday through Thursday at our offices, the Commission's offices in, in, in Arlington. Uh, the bulk of that meeting will be to review uh, our base models for, uh, for both species and uh, wrap up the assessment work uh, at that meeting. And the plan is to then uh, finalize the reports following that meeting and go to peer review uh, likely sometime in November. Uh, and for the uh, Atlantic Croker assessment, the um, primary model right now is a stock synthesis model. And for SPOT, we're looking at two uh, modeling approaches, a surplus production model and a two-staged uh, catch survey analysis. Um, so those will be the models that we're reviewing next week and, and moving forward with. Uh, and so if there are any questions on, on those assessments, I can take those now as well. Any questions? No, our next agenda item was uh, approval of fishery, manage or fishery management plan reviews. And Tony suggested, and I think it's a good idea, that we do this via email. Um, are there any, just, in, just because of the time that it's taking, are there any objections to approval of the Atlantic Croker and Red Drum plan reviews via email. Seeing none, is there any other business that we have before the board? We've been here all morning, it seems like. Uh, seeing none, is there any, object in, in any objection to adjourning, or do I have a motion to adjourn? adjourn? Robert? <laughs> so moved, Mr. Chairman. Malcolm, second, and we are adjourned. Thanks. We will start the Tatog board as soon as we can transition over in, you know, about five or ten minutes. <laughs>